Theresa May tells Britain she will take the country out of the single market, but Parliament will get a veto on the Brexit deal she must now negotiate. What I am proposing cannot mean membership of the single market. Good evening. Speaking from the very same building where Margaret Thatcher extolled the virtues of the single market, Theresa May vowed to leave it, but to negotiate the best possible access to it. In her most important speech since becoming Prime Minister, she vowed to put the deal she makes with the rest of the EU to Parliament. The pound rose in response to the prospect of a parliamentary vote. It was an assured, lengthy and ambitious speech. But at its heart, this most cautious of politicians took a giant gamble by threatening to walk away without a deal if the EU doesn't give her what she wants. While I am sure a positive agreement can be reached, I am equally clear that no deal for Britain is better than a bad deal for Britain. And good evening from New York City, where Donald Trump is making his final preparations before his inauguration in Washington on Friday. He does so in the knowledge that his approval ratings for an incoming president are the lowest in living memory. And as rumors swirl that fresh allegations may be made against him in the next hour, the man who he wants to be his friend, Russia's President Putin, has come to his aid today, declaring that those who wrote that so-called intelligence dossier are worse than prostitutes. Here, no lesser figure than Henry Kissinger has words of caution for Mr. Trump. I have seen a succession of American presidencies disintegrate. And I do not think we can afford another calamity. And in this city that made Trump great again after no fewer than six bankruptcies, we find little pride in this New Yorker making it to the White House. Well, it was, said some pro-Europeans, a destructive, hard Brexit. Others accused Theresa May of trying to have her cake and eat it, proving that while the speech cleared up some confusion, much about the future of Britain's relationship with the EU remains unclear. Of one thing, though, there was no doubt. The Prime Minister is talking tough with the rest of Europe. She threatened the EU that if they offered Britain a bad deal, it would end up being a calamitous act of self-harm, perhaps implying the UK would respond by luring European businesses with the promise of low taxes. Here's our political editor, Gary Gibbon. Are we going to get a detailed plan, Prime Minister? To Lancaster House they came, the Prime Minister to announce her Brexit vision and Europe's ambassadors to listen and report back. Their capitals can decide on whether her plan becomes reality. The Prime Minister warned them they'd harm themselves if they tried to harm Britain, and she gave them a bit more clarity on what she wanted and what she wasn't pursuing in negotiations. So we do not seek membership of the single market. Instead, we seek the greatest possible access to it through a new, comprehensive, bold and ambitious free trade agreement. And because we will no longer be members of the single market, we will not be required to contribute huge sums to the EU budget. Theresa May said she hoped as part of that free trade agreement, the EU would let some sectors, like car manufacturing, carry on enjoying smooth access to the EU market. With her international trade secretary itching to negotiate new trade deals around the world, she acknowledged Britain would have to leave the EU customs union and its unified trade policy. But she hoped the UK could continue to enjoy some of the perks of membership. Whether that means we must reach a completely new customs agreement, become an associate member of the customs union in some way, or remain a signatory to some elements of it, I hold no preconceived position. I have an open mind on how we do it. It is not the means that matter, but the ends. Britain's new representative to the EU was watching. His predecessor resigned, believing that Theresa May's two-year timetable to negotiate a completely new relationship with Europe was unachievable. Today, Theresa May recommitted to exactly that. There might be a period of adjustment, but not a moment beyond March 2019 under EU laws. So I do not mean that we will seek some form of unlimited transitional status in which we find ourselves stuck forever in some kind of permanent political purgatory. 
I want us to have reached an agreement about our future partnership by the time the two-year Article 50 process has concluded. And then came the sting in the tail, a warning to the EU not to mess with her. Yet I know there are some voices calling for a punitive deal that punishes Britain and discourages other countries from taking the same path. That would be an act of calamitous self-harm for the countries of Europe and it would not be the act of a friend. Britain would not, indeed we could not, accept such an approach. No deal for Britain is better than a bad deal for Britain. That, her aide said, showed Theresa May learning lessons from David Cameron's failed attempt at a renegotiation. You get nothing, they said, unless the other side is convinced you're ready to walk. Just in terms of that customs union thing you were talking about, do you think there really is an appetite for breaking it down into component parts and doing a deal that suits Britain down to the ground? Well, as, as the Prime Minister herself said, um, there has to be compromise. This is a negotiation. Uh, both sides will be looking to maximise uh, their own interests. But these, there'll be some resistance, won't there? There will certainly, I think, be resistance. Yes. Just for Britain, yes. special terms, associate yes, membership, correct. call it what you may. Uh, yes. Sounds a bit like the very sort of pick and mix that Europe doesn't normally like people having. Do you think? There special, will be relations, that. special relationships are difficult, as we have seen with Switzerland and other countries. You know, there is always, you know, it takes time. There is always quite a complicated process getting there. We've been told the appetite for those sort of special relationships has decreased amongst the other countries. It's, it's, it's true indeed. Scotland's first minister had said single market membership for Scotland, if not the whole of the UK, was her bottom line. I am making very clear that I will not allow Scotland's interest to be steamrollered over. So there'll be another independence Look, referendum? Look, if there is an independence referendum is the only way to protect Scotland's interest, I've been very clear that that will happen. I've been clear on that since the 24th of June. But I'll continue to take decisions, not for the benefit of the media, but in an orderly way that are for the benefit of the country. The Prime Minister 28 the years ago, Margaret Thatcher was in Lancaster House to get market. British business prepared for the joyous new single market a level playing field for goods and services that would boost everyone's trade across Europe. It's a market that's bigger than Japan, bigger than the United States, it's on your doorstep. Today, Theresa May said the referendum showed British voters judged the price of single market membership, free movement and EU laws too high. It'll be years before we know the price or benefits of leaving. Well, Gary is in Westminster now. Gary, so many different interpretations of this speech. What's your interpretation? Well, I was talking to some of the EU ambassadors there and talking to some EU officials as well over in Brussels, and they have a sense that what Theresa May is asking for, they appreciate the clarity, the extra clarity that they got today, not particularly the menace, but they think what she's asking for is cherry-picking. Uh, not maybe major cherry-picking, but cherry-picking nonetheless, not maybe on the scale that was once envisaged. Theresa May's aides say, no, if you're uh, going for a free trade agreement, that's not, that's not cherry-picking, that's something else altogether. The other thing that you hear a lot of is that uh, in, in, on the continent, they just don't get that timetable that she's working to. Uh, she was hearing this, as I understand it, from the uh, man who's now gone as her man in, in Brussels. Two years to not only negotiate your way out of Europe, but to negotiate a new relationship uh, and to get that ratified across Europe. That just is too tight, they all say. One official said to me, not possible. Another one said it doesn't make sense. Very unlikely this is possible at all. Among here, amongst the Brexiteers, they're pretty euphoric for the most part. They love the idea of Theresa May saying she'd walk away from a deal. Uh, the idea of walking away from a deal holds no fear for them whatsoever. The UKIP leader has said it sounds 70% like a UKIP speech. Labour, a bit confused tonight. Uh, Keir Starmer, the Brexit spokesman, came to the Commons and said uh, Theresa May has avoided hard Brexit. An awful lot of Labour MPs, not to mention Lib Dems and, and a Green said they can't really understand uh, how he comes to that conclusion. Maybe Keir Starmer was overexcited because Theresa May seems to have conceded to him there will be a vote in Parliament on a final deal. But what's the alternative on the piece of paper if you're voting against the deal? No clarity on that. All very murky. Gary, thank you very much. Well, earlier I spoke to the Work and Pension Secretary, Damien Green, and I asked him if the trade deal wanted by the Prime Minister was a case of having her cake and eating it. 
Trade is not a zero-sum game. Actually, both sides benefit from it. So it's in our interest, clearly, to have as free trade as possible, as friction as trade as possible with the EU. But it's also in the interest of other EU countries as well. That's why uh, we're optimistic that we can get uh, a good deal. In the past, you've said that quitting the single market would, quote, cost us jobs and push up prices. You also said plenty of experts agree that being outside the single market would be the main reason why leaving the EU would cause huge economic damage. Have you changed your mind? Well, I, I argued the case as hard as I could, and others did as well. And, and, and you still believe and, that? And we lost, we lost the argument. So but you still what, believe what that? You do In your as, heart of hearts, do you as, still well, believe I, that? Well, it's irrelevant because we lost the argument and we're leaving the EU. What matters now is to do the best deal for Britain. It's particularly, obviously, true as a responsibility as a member of the government uh, to make sure that we get the best deal possible, that we don't lose jobs, that we don't lose prosperity. That was the, the path the Prime Minister set out today. And we've, we've seen that since, uh, since the, the referendum in June, actually, the British economy has continued to do well. We've kept unemployment low. Uh, we seem to be still attractive to uh, inward investors. And so the government has to be creative in ways of, of keeping Britain as attractive as possible as an international investment destination, as an international trading nation. But you clearly still believe in your heart of hearts that there is the potential for, quote, huge economic damage by quitting the single market? Well, I didn't observe huge economic damage at the moment, and it's my job and the job well, we of every, left the single market ev the everyone else in government to make sure that the strengths of Britain that we uh, expressed inside the single market will continue uh, after we've left it. And a lot of that obviously depends on the deal we can negotiate. But there is the potential for huge economic damage. Well, that's what we're trying to avoid, and so far we've not seen that. So because it seems we haven't to me, left the single well, market, we yeah, but, but also it's, it's, it's not just that. I think it's, it, it's fair to point out that even though people know we're now leaving the EU, big international companies like Google and many others in, in different sectors, both manufacturing and service companies, are saying, no, we want to base ourselves in Britain, and more people are doing that. So it shows that the suite of attractions that Britain has are with, you know, with our laws, with our deregulated economy, uh, with our infrastructure, with our skills. We can make ourselves attractive. You in the past have said that any British government could expect to spend at least 10 years trying to renegotiate ourselves back into a position in which we had, would have any kind of reasonable access to our largest export market. Well, we've, we've, we've got the two year period after uh, Article 50 is invoked uh, by the end of March. And, and then one, another eight years. And, well, one of the important points uh, the Prime Minister made today was that we, we, we might need, in some areas, an implementation phase. The phased um, I, renegotiation. Yes, and, and that will be probably different amounts of time for different uh, parts of, of the change. If but for could it, that be eight years? No, could I, it... I, I think, that, I mean, obviously, we, everyone wants this to be as quick as possible, you know, particularly business, they don't want certainty. The thing that business really wanted to know was that there wasn't going to be a cliff edge, um, that suddenly at, at the end of two years or whenever, uh, everything had to change overnight because that's difficult for government and it's difficult for business. So one of the points the Prime Minister was making today is that we'd have this implementation phase to avoid that cliff edge. But that implementation phase could go on for many years. I, 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 I doubt that and obviously it's, it's in everyone's interest for that not to happen. Damien Green, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I'm joined now by the Shadow Foreign Secretary, Labour's Emily Thornbury. Um, so, is it a hard Brexit or not? Um, Labour seems rather confused. Perhaps you can enlighten us. Oh, I wish we could. I wish we could. I think that there are still you know, so many questions arising out of this speech. If, for example, she says that she wants us to not be in half, half in Europe and half out of Europe, she wants us to be out of Europe, and yet she talks about being in a customs union. And then she says, well, she doesn't mean customs union as anybody else understands customs union. She's going to do her own customs union. She's going to have her own deal. She says that we're going to be a great trading nation. And yet she seems to want to walk away from the biggest block with whom we give trade. I mean, and so it goes on. There are so many questions. One thing that is clear is that she says, unless I get what I want, I threaten you with this. And okay. you don't threaten someone with something you're not prepared to do. And what they're threatening the European Union with is pretty bad, but actually it's even worse for Britain what it is that she's threatening. OK, but the other thing we know for certain is that the UK is pulling out of the single market. Now, Jeremy Corbyn in November said that quitting the single market was his bottom line and that he'd trigger a general election if that happened. 
We have to have a deal which looks after our economy first and foremost. And what she's saying is, she's kind of touching all the right buttons in terms of today. She's saying, you know, I want to have, I want to have full access to the single market. I want it to be unfettered. I want it to be tariff-free. But she's she quitting says all the single those market, things. which was exactly. Jeremy Corbyn's bottom line. Well, she's. But so he'll trigger a but general election. No, but effectively, she's saying by what she said in her speech. I'm sorry, but it's, I appreciate this is confused. But it, you know, it's her speech. I'm trying to react to. She says that she's leaving the single market and yet she's keeping all the good things she claims from the single market. And she says, and let, do let me make this point, Cathy, that unless she gets that, she threatens Britain with a deregulated race to the bottom where she's going to try and attract lots and lots of other companies by asking them to pay hardly any tax at all, okay. which will completely change accept... Britain for the worse. And OK, I accept, the, I accept your point about the but ambiguity really... of the speech, yeah. but you're also ambiguous in your position. I mean, Jeremy Corbyn was quite clear that quitting the single market was a bottom line. Will you at the least vote against this deal to quit the single market in Parliament? What we're going to try and do is we're going to try and push this government into making sure that we have to leave the we have to leave the European Union. That's what the British people have asked us to do. But we have to get the best possible deal, which means looking after the economy first. And we think that having proper access to the single market is absolutely got to be a bottom line. There must. But be... you're not you're, you're so pedalling back from oh. uh, voting against um, quitting the single market. No, no, no. We have we have not said that we're going to frustrate leaving the European Union. We will be voting for you know for triggering Article 50. But, but you don't know which... whether you're going to vote for quitting the single market. But the, but the things that concern us from today is she still doesn't answer our questions, but she has said, unless I get everything that I want, I am going to turn Britain into an entirely different type of country. I mean, you know, Hammond said it and then she said it today. I don't think we should gloss over this. And what it means is it means that people, corporations will be paying hardly any tax, will be like some sort of Cayman Islands or some form of Singapore. And, you know, hard on the heels of not paying any tax will mean, you know, if we were to go down to the same level of, of corporation tax as other countries, we would be losing £100 billion. That would be taken out of public services and then we would have to deregulate the labour market and so it would go on. This okay. is a race to the bottom. We've been talking about everything that hasn't been clear about the speech mm. but the other thing that was crystal clear was that controlling immigration is more important to this government uh, than membership of the single market. Your position on immigration is still somewhat confused, isn't it? So I just want to see if I can get clarity on that. Well, let, let is me, let me EU just... migration okay. too high? So, so the first... Is EU migration too high to the no, UK? So the first thing no, no, the... I just want clarity on yeah, that point. The first thing the government has said is actually immigration is more important than anything else, than anything else at all. You know, so we do not have that position. We think that the economy is more important But I'm trying to get clarity on your position by answering the question, else. is EU migration to the UK? I think that we have said that we're not going to die in a ditch for the sake of, of freedom of movement. There are many things that could be improved in relation to, to migration from the EU. But I'm not asking about dying in a ditch. I'm asking, right. is EU migration too we're high, saying, yes or no? We're saying that it's open to negotiation, but the, but the first and foremost has to be the economy. And frankly, the answers that she was giving today, or trying to give today, actually ask, you know, opens up a whole lot more questions. But the one Quite thing like she your said for sure... Tonight, but but Emily one thing Thornbury, she said for I'm really sorry, we have to leave it there, but thank you very much for joining Not us. Not at all, Cathy. Well, Theresa May's Brexit speech saw a surge in the pound as the markets, which had been preparing for a hard Brexit, responded to the removal of uncertainties and the promise of a parliamentary vote. But is British business so easily satisfied? Our business editor, Siobhan Kennedy, is at a motor manufacturer in Dudley in the West Midlands. Siobhan... Well, Cathy, businesses have been asking for months for certainty and today they got it. We're pulling out of the single market and most likely the customs union too. They know, if you like, that we're headed for the door. They got that certainty. It's just that they have no clue what's on the other side of that door. And I think it's that that businesses still find very daunting, despite those reassuring words from Theresa May today. Ironically, though, it's that clarity that investors embrace, that clarity of leaving the single market. I say um, ironically because for months it's been fears of Britain leaving the single market that have helped push sterling down lower. Yet today we found out that's exactly what's going to happen and investors embraced it. They embraced it, they welcomed that clarity and they pushed, as you say, the pound to the highest level since October 2008. But Cathy, let's see how long that relief rally lasts because there are still so many details, particularly for businesses like these, that are yet to be sorted. Government would love to see more businesses like these. 
Westfield hand builds British sports cars from the heart of the West Midlands and sends them all over the world. But has Theresa May just made their life a whole lot harder? More than 60% of the cars made inside this factory last year were exported to the European Union, while the majority of the key components inside these cars were imported from the EU. In fact, it would be hard to imagine a British industry more interwoven with Europe than this one, which is why the idea of pulling out of the single market is pretty scary. We um, bought this factory 10 years ago and we now... Julian Turner says being in the single market is vital to his family-run business. So it's very important to be in a single market to allow us to trade very easily. That's buying goods from abroad but also selling them and uh, Europe is one of our biggest markets. What's your reaction today to the Prime Minister saying we are in fact going to have to pull out of the single market? So I'm quite concerned about some of the things that have been raised today because it just means for some people, especially us, um, there's a lot more uncertainty. Um, what's going to happen with the single market you know, in terms of the negotiations for both our suppliers and also our customers? And with our customers, majority of our customers being in Europe, it's going to have a very big impact. So it's like waiting to see what's going to happen. It's a very big risk to the company. But the impact of leaving the EU dawned months ago and now he's trying to import fewer parts from Europe and export more internationally. In the meantime, we can still continue to sell into Europe. However, we've got a very aggressive strategy to start selling abroad. Places like Korea, America, you know, the quick trade deal that they're interested in. So we are trying to mitigate that risk by looking further afield outside of Europe. The cold reality is that whatever businesses want, Theresa May knew that to deliver Brexit she had to control immigration. People here agree. I don't really think immigrants should be allowed in this country, basically. At all? At all, yeah. Tell me why. Uh, just because there's not many jobs for English people. You go somewhere, obviously, for a job. Loads of English people are trying to get jobs and they can't. And you go in and it's all immigrants working there. And same with housing and stuff. It's all immigrants that have got the houses now, and like the NHS as well. Has immigration done harm to you here? It, it will do if it carries on. But if that also means pulling out of the single market, which isn't brilliant for businesses, particularly here where they're growing and successful, does that matter? Shall be. Well, it's unfortunate, obviously, from an economic point of view, because uh, I think the single market uh, is obviously very good for the economy. Um, so I mean, in terms of immigration on a personal basis, I didn't really have a major problem with it anyway. Business finally got some answers today. It might not be the outcome they wanted, but the certainty of hearing Theresa May say categorically that we're leaving the single market is better than all the speculation and guesswork. But much still remains uncertain, and it could be years before we find out if we can strike the type of trade deal that the Prime Minister is hoping for. And in the interim, the reality of Brexit remains the same. A weakened pound and increased prices. And there's very little, bar the brief rally in Stirling today, that Theresa May can do about either of them. The impact of the falling pound was made abundantly clear in figures today that showed the cost of raw materials for factories like these rose nearly 16% over the year. That's feeding through into higher inflation for consumers, up 1.6% on the year, the fastest rate since the middle of 2014. There was some small comfort for businesses, a so-called phased process of implementation, hopefully over years, not months, to smooth the path to the new future, however uncertain it remains. Siobhan Kennedy reporting there. Well, the implication of Theresa May's Brexit speech have reverberated around Europe. The Prime Minister has meetings with the lead Europeans, Donald Tusk and Jean-Claude Juncker, in the next few days, as well as the German Chancellor, Angela Merkel. The EU Council President, Mr Tusk, has already tweeted that the PM's speech was at least more realistic, adding that the other 27 member states were ready to negotiate. But the European Parliament's Brexit negotiator in Brussels says they won't stomach any cherry-picking. The illusion that you can go out of the single market, that you can go out of the customs union, and that you can cherry-pick, that you can have still a number of uh, advantages. Uh, and yeah, I think that this uh, will, will not happen. We shall never accept uh, a situation in which uh, it is better to be outside uh, the European Union, outside uh, the single market, than to be uh, uh, a member of the European Union. 
the forthright view from Brussels there. Uh, well, that's it for me here for now. Let's go live now to New York and to John. John. Thanks, Kathy. Well, now here in New York, I've been speaking to a survivor of many U.S. administrations, Henry Kissinger. At 93, he's candid, saying he has witnessed too many presidencies that have ended in disintegration, and he doesn't want to see another. We'll be hearing from him a little later. At the same time, new polling suggests that Trump's popularity has slumped to the lowest for an incoming president in four decades. However, Russian President Putin has come to his defence today, declaring the affairs of the Russian dossier to be a hoax. We're joined from Washington now by Kylie Morris. Kylie. John, this performance from Vladimir Putin crying crocodile tears over the idea that Donald Trump might have been the victim of a hoax and at the same time bragging about the quality of Russian prostitutes is really beyond satire. Uh, it plays deliberately, one suspects, into the grievance that Donald Trump has with US intelligence agencies over whether they've abused their power to leak what he says is disinformation about him. Now, here in Washington, D.C., people are, in fact, starting to arrive to attend this inauguration. The theme of Donald Trump's speech is going to be unity, we're told. But there are certainly many factors working against that. Forty Democrats now in Congress say they won't attend the inauguration ceremony in protest. And that's just the kind of political infighting that Vladimir Putin, hardly a disinterested foreign observer, described at his press conference today. With enemies like these, who needs friends? The Russian president today sprang to the defense of Donald Trump and spectacularly empathized with him over those trying to undermine Mr. Trump's convincing victory. People who order hoaxes like those now spread against the president-elect, who fake them and use them for political gain, are worse than prostitutes. They have no moral limitations. As for the hoax that Russian spies might hold compromising information on Donald Trump, even video of him with prostitutes, don't be silly. Although, admittedly, Russian prostitutes are the best. This is a man who for years organized beauty contests and socialized with the most beautiful women in the world. I find it difficult to believe that he ran to a hotel to meet with our girls of reduced social responsibility, although we do have the best in the world. The unlikely embrace by Mr. Trump of the Russian leader and his simmering dispute with American intelligence agencies has even those in his own party trying to set the record straight. Vladimir Putin is the guy that has sent airplanes with precision weapons to strike hospitals in Aleppo, killing thousands of innocent men, women and children. He's a thug and a butcher. In his final days in office, Joe Biden has visited Ukraine to reassure President Poroshenko's commitment to the current sanctions regime. It's hard to hear, but when he's asked whether the next administration would make Ukraine a priority, the vice president replies, Hope springs eternal. Hope springs eternal. Also reassuring to European allies, boots on the ground. 300 U.S. Marines landed in Norway this week for a six-month deployment. That's as well as thousands more troops in Poland. Nothing to do with Russia, Norway says, just training for winter warfare. If you believe the polls, and Donald Trump clearly doesn't, more Americans consider Russia a threat now than they did before the presidential election. And the popularity of the man about to assume office compares poorly with previous presidents. Only 40% of Americans hold a favorable view of him, which prompted the tweet. The same people who did the phony election polls and were so wrong are now doing approval rating polls. They are rigged just like before. A mint in Russia has released a coin with his likeness, imprinted on the back the words, in Trump we trust. But at home, the next president still must persuade a majority of Americans they can do that. Kylie Morris in Washington. Well, here in New York, I earlier was talking with Henry Kissinger, the U.S. Secretary of State under Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford. He's remained an influential, if sometimes controversial, voice of U.S. diplomacy over the intervening decades. He is a long-standing confidant of President Putin and a recent backer of Donald Trump. I began by asking him about the relationship with Moscow and President Putin. Could he envisage a breakthrough? Well, I have argued for several years that a fundamental dialogue with Russia is essential. And I believe it is extremely important. 
I do not put the same emphasis on personal relations that some of the media do. But I mean, Gorbachev, Gorbachev and Reagan had chemistry. Do, can you see Trump and Putin having chemistry? You know each of them? I mean, do you see them as potential? I know each of them. I can imagine them having chemistry. Uh, but my perception would be that Trump's approach is that of a negotiator of a deal. Uh, Putin's approach is that of a strategist attempting to define a new position for Russia. Have you enjoyed uh, Mr. Trump's tweets? And should he go on tweeting once he's president? Uh, I think they are, they're amusing. They're psychologically very perceptive when he talks about personalities. It's a new style of conducting diplomacy. I have never seen it applied to the actual negotiation between leaders of great countries. And so I reserve judgment on that. All the presidents you have worked for and interacted with have been politicians. Yeah. I mean, I know Reagan had been an actor, but he'd been the governor of California. But this man has had no political experience at all. Aren't you scared? I, no, I'm, I'm not scared. It's a new experience. I, of course, never expected him to be president. The test will be not whether he's amusing, but whether he's substantial. And... Uh, well, do you think he's substantial? I, uh, I have to see what actually happens. Uh, I think he has an unusual opportunity, an almost unique opportunity for this reason. Much of the world and many of the leaders that I know, whatever they thought about Obama, were uneasy about the apparent withdrawal of the United States from international affairs. And they therefore developed a feeling about the importance of an American role. And therefore, a successor of Obama uh, was going to get the benefit of countries wanting to re-engage America. You've been very kind today, really, to Mr. Trump. You've been pretty generous in his direction. Yeah. Um, was it wise to compare the intelligence agencies with Nazi Germany, as he did? Uh, I would not, uh, I do not agree with that. And I would not have recommended this if he had asked my uh, my opinion. Uh, whatever the shortcomings of the intelligence agencies, they're not the shortcomings of Nazi Germany, which I experienced directly. Doesn't that make you want to sort of slightly question his judgment? Trump is a new phenomenon. And my attitude is influenced by the fact that I served in the Nixon administration and that I have seen a succession of American presidencies disintegrate. And I do not think we can afford another calamity. So I have urged my friends to try to give, uh, to give Trump a chance. He's been very dismissive of NATO and of the European Union. He doesn't like these blocks. And I'm wondering whether you think, with the world in the kind of tumult that it's in at the moment, whether this is a good idea for Britain to be leaving Europe for Brexit to take place. Uh, I thought that in the world that is emerging, an autonomous Britain can play an unusually creative role. It gives Britain an opportunity to play its unique role as a bridge between America and Europe and to stay in Europe on matters in which it can make its unique contribution while still acting in a dis historically distinctive manner. Dr. Kissinger, 
Thank you very much indeed for talking to us. Henry Kissinger, more from here later on. What New York thinks of its most famous property mogul becoming president. But for now, back to London. And Cathy. Thanks, John. Well, let's look at today's other news. And the former Foreign Secretary Jack Straw could be sued by a former Libyan dissident who was allegedly kidnapped by the CIA in 2004 and taken to Libya. Abdul Hakim Belhaj claims MI6 helped with his rendition, after which he was imprisoned and tortured. Mr Straw has rejected claims he'd been aware of the operation. Here's our political correspondent, Michael Crick. Files found inside Libyan intelligence by Human Rights Watch after the fall of Colonel Gaddafi have proved hugely embarrassing to the British government. In one fax, a top MI6 man, Mark Allen, now Sir Mark, seemed to take credit for helping the CIA deliver a Libyan dissident, Abdul Hakim Belhaj, to the Gaddafi regime. The intelligence, Sir Mark boasted, was British. But today, the UK Supreme Court rejected an attempt by the British government to stop Mr Belhaj suing over the possible role of MI6, the Foreign Office and the then Foreign Secretary Jack Straw in the alleged kidnapping by the CIA of Belhaj and his wife in Asia and their subsequent torture in Libya. Authorities have not, on the assumed facts, shown any entitlement to rely on the doctrine of foreign act of state. The appeals are therefore dismissed and the cases may proceed to trial. Welcoming the verdict in Istanbul, Abdul Hakim Belhaj told my colleague Jonathan Rugman he's not suing to make money. I didn't ask for any money in bringing this case because, frankly, I asked for an apology for this crime against me. I didn't talk about any money or ask about any. I just wanted an apology, but the UK government refused. They didn't respond to my request for an apology, so we went to court. I don't want to raise your taxes. Jack Straw today denied doing anything wrong. All his decisions complied with the law, he said. He was never complicit in the unlawful rendition or detention of anyone by other states. So now ministers face a difficult choice. The UK government has two options. Uh, Mr. Bahaj and his wife have always been clear that they would withdraw this case, go home, forgive and forget, if the UK government would just apologise. Um, so we very much hope Theresa May will take another look at the case and say she's sorry. But failing that, we're ready. We look forward to a full trial of the facts. It'll be the first proper trial of rendition if it happens. And we're ready to go to court. We were tortured in Bangkok, on the plane. In Gaddafi's regime, we suffered a lot. We want British justice to see the reality of these documents that proved those parties were involved in returning us and then give its decision. And this case is even more important now, say the Lib Dems, with the advent of Donald Trump, who openly supports torture. We share intelligence with the United States of America at the moment. We have never in the past shared intelligence with any administration that openly admitted the use of torture. That's why this matters for the government here in the United Kingdom today. Would Theresa May condemn the American use of torture? Or is the special relationship rather more important? Reporting there. The search has ended for the missing Malaysia Airlines flight MH370 that disappeared almost three years ago with 239 people on board. The Boeing 777 aircraft vanished from radar in March 2014 while en route to Beijing from the Malaysian capital Kuala Lumpur. Authorities said the search had scoured 46,000 square miles of the southern Indian Ocean without success. A relative of one of the passengers described the decision as a betrayal to the families affected. Now, police officers were given inaccurate information as they began a pre-planned operation in which a suspected armed robber was shot dead by a police marksman, an inquiry has heard. Anthony Granger was shot through the window of a stolen car in a Cheshire car park in 2012. The public inquiry in Liverpool was told that the police watchdog, the IPCC, found serious failings by the police and individual officers. Simeon Brown reports. Marina Schofield has waited for this day for almost five years. But it was only last year that the Prime Minister agreed to allow the inquest for her son to become a full-blown public inquiry that will uncover the circumstances of Anthony Granger's death. 
In March 2012, Mr Granger was shot dead by armed officers from Greater Manchester Police. The officers suspected Anthony Granger of being part of a plot to commit armed robbery. The car he was sat in was stolen, but Anthony Granger was not armed. No guns were ever recovered or found at his home. For months he'd been under surveillance as part of Operation Shine. An investigation the Independent Police Complaints Commission has criticised. On day one of the inquiry, the court heard claims of police failings. Following the shooting, the Independent Police Complaints Commission launched an investigation. That report has never been made public. But the inquiry heard it found the operation relied heavily on out-of-date intelligence and that briefings to officers were not only flawed but contained inaccurate information. And those were not the only problems of an operation that cost Anthony Granger his life. Today the court heard that of the five GMP officers in command, there were occupational competency problems with four of them. Some described as significant. But the officer who took the fatal shot maintained he had clear justification and that he believed at that moment his life was in danger. Today the court heard that the officer known only as Q9 was adequately trained but for the loved ones of Anthony Granger, their concern rests on the officers in command. I'm really glad that the inquiry has started to make progress now. I'm quite concerned on, about the fact that a lot of the senior officers don't, didn't have the relevant training for the positions that they held. And one thing I want to get out of it is some answers as to why Anthony was shot. Today, Anthony Granger's mother left court after hearing how a high-risk police intervention became fatal. The inquiry will last four months and some parts will be heard behind closed doors as it forensically considers not only any police failings but if the life of Anthony Granger could have been saved. After the break here in New York, the views of the city about one of its own, Donald J. Trump, and those of the editor of Vanity Fair, Graydon Carter. Welcome back to Manhattan. Here in Donald Trump's hometown, there is a palpable sense of both apprehension and expectancy three days before the inauguration. This city may not have voted for him en masse, but there's a recognition of the business qualities that a seasoned New York real estate mogul can bring to the role of Commander-in-Chief. New York City. City of real estate. City of business. City of deal. He symbolizes success in New York. One of the most important skills that I see in Donald Trump are instincts. He has, he has instincts like no one else. It's instincts, it's guts. Uh, to be a real estate developer in this city, you need to have those things, instincts and guts, and you need to be able to take risks. Yet Donald Trump did not win New York and still hasn't. I thought it was a joke. I didn't think he would make it past the uh, primaries. And then when he was an actual candidate, I was like, wow. But I didn't think he would win. But I'm not surprised, ultimately. You know, it just speaks to things that I've talked about for many, many years, which is how prevalent racism is. It's just more subtle now. Two colliding voices, and in the middle, Trump and his towers. What it is is that there's, there's rent-stabilized tenants that you can't get rid of or uh, tenants that you can't buy off. Jason Meister, a property developer, worked for Trump's campaign. He says what some see as criticisms, he sees as strengths. What Trump does well is that he doesn't tell or foretell where he's, what his moves are going to be. I think he's not, you can't read him. And so I think that is a good skill set for a president to have. Um, he's not going to tell our enemies what he's going to do next. Trump has been a developer here for 30 years or more, been bankrupt six times, and is both reviled and praised for what he's done. New Yorkers escape the real estate spats and the skyscrapers by strolling above the busy streets on the High Line, the garden walk that has replaced the city's overhead railway. He isn't the person I voted for, but as Americans we have to come together and we have to try and help anybody in office. That's what the American way is. Well, we're waiting to uh, observe and survive. We're wondering how you're feeling about your president to come on Friday. Not very good. Why so, sir? Well, I'm, uh, 
I'm, I'm shocked that America has elected a president like Trump. He really does not represent most Americans. I'm an American woman, and it, it's hard for me to understand how any woman can be in support of a man who is blatantly sexist and actually misogynist. You're not worried about him? No, I'm not worried about him at all. Did you vote for him? I did vote for him. And you're pleased you did? Uh, out of the choice that I had, yes. Yeah. No, I love the show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Show's about to start. <laughs> Back at Trump Tower, the red lights of the Gucci store on the ground floor mingle with the flashing blue police lights standing guard outside. The band may be playing on at New York's Lincoln Center, but in doing so, it cannot drown the reality that this country is on the cusp of a journey like no other. Led by a property developer and TV reality star with no experience of political power, and no one knows where on these cold, damp winter streets it will take this country. New Yorkers on Donald Trump's accession to the presidency. Well, earlier tonight we heard the views of Henry Kissinger, but I've also been speaking with Graydon Carter, the nemesis of Mr. Trump, a man who's been chasing Trump for about 10 years trying to find out more about him. He's the editor of Vanity Fair magazine, and I asked him what sort of president he thinks Trump will make. Well, you sort of want him to be a great president because the country could use that now. I just don't think he has the capacity or the, the skill set to do that. And I think the first people that will realize that will be um, the people who supported him. I can't see what he's going to do with it, uh, for them, given the people he has surrounded himself with. His ratings are looking terrible. I mean, uh, can he get himself up again? Well, the country is really divided, and the only way he can become a successful president is by paying attention to the, the majority of people who voted for the other candidate. If he ignores them completely, he'll have a real rough time of it, and it will, he'll go down, he'll, his popularity will decline because he can't bring you know, steel and coal jobs back to the Rust Belt states. He just, they are, they're non-existent now. Mm -hmm. So he will, he's made a lot of promises, and he'll have trouble filling 50% of those, I suspect. One of the issues is that we thought the nearer the presidency he got, the quieter he'd become, but it's been quite the reverse. You don't know him that well. He, he is incapable of being quiet, I think. He, I, uh, um, I know a friend, taught, you know, if you, I've had dinner with him, and he's sort of entertaining in his own way. He never stops talking throughout dinner. There's nobody else gets a chance to, to say anything, and I think it's going to be that kind of administration as well where he is the, the front man for every major decision. Well, in, in spite of the friction between you, I mean, he never liked the fact that you talked about his small hands and all the rest of it. You have been to see him recently, and I know that talk was off the record, but how did you find it? He came up to Connie and asked to talk to a number of editors, and it was off the record, which I thought we shouldn't have done it, or just not done it altogether. But he was, he was very much in character. You know, we used to have an expression describing him at Spy Magazine in the 80s as, he, as a hustler on his best behavior. He, um, he, was, uh, he tried very hard to win the room, and I'm not sure he succeeded. There is something pretty good in this for you, because after all, your magazine has put on figures ever since Trump got this close to the White House. Well, we reviewed a restaurant that's in, the, in Trump Tower. It's called the Trump Grill. I didn't even know it existed until recently and uh, we call it maybe the worst restaurant in America. And he tweeted that morning that Mag the Vanity Fair was in trouble, that the numbers, our numbers were off, and then I was a complete loser, and I was going to lose my job. And so we put this as a banner across our website, and we got 80,000 subscribers in 10 days, which is a hundredfold over what we normally get during that period. But one thing's for sure, a president cannot go on feuding with the media the way Trump has. Well, they're not taking away his cell phone and, or his Twitter account, and he's like a, he's like a child. He's going to continue doing it. He, you know, the, this past week, just attacking two of the, the most respected Americans you can find out there, Meryl Streep and uh, John Lewis, a, 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 icon, a living icon of the civil rights movement, that he would take after people like that. It means that, like, nobody is off limits. How long do you think he'll last? I mean, as, as president or as yeah. a person? Well, president. Um, I'd be surprised if it goes the full term, but I'm not good at predicting them when it comes to Donald Trump. But it's unlikely that a man would walk away from the presidency just because he's worried about his business. I think that um, 
I think they're going to have to be very careful on legalities of being president of the United States. I think that uh, even his supporters will not accept him going too much beyond the bounds of, uh, of what's already established. I think he's going to have to play, you know, close to the law. Graydon Carter, the editor of Vanity Fair, and for more of an insight into the an analysis into the mind of Donald Trump, Matt Fry's documentary Meet the Trumps is on Channel 4 at 10 o'clock tonight. Now, while we've been on air, there's been an extraordinary development in Los Angeles. We don't know exactly what it is, but uh, it, it, it has something to do with sex and an allegation. So I want to go to Kylie in Washington. Kylie, what do you make of it? Well, John, this is what we know so far. Gloria Allred, who's a very high-profile lawyer who normally acts on behalf of victims of sexual assault or sexual abuse, is about to hold a press conference. Uh, she has said that at that press conference she'll be introducing a woman who accuses Donald Trump of sexually inappropriate conduct. We don't know whether this is someone who's made these kinds of allegations before against Donald Trump or whether these are fresh allegations. Um, so that is due to happen soon, we're told in Los Angeles. Certainly uh, after that reality TV tape came out where Donald Trump see, appeared to be bragging about sexual assault, there were as many as a dozen women who made public their claims or their stories that they had been sexually assaulted or sexually harassed by Donald Trump. He has always denied uh, those claims and has admitted and apologized for the kinds of behaviors uh, that he described in, uh, in that reality TV tape about the things that you can do to women uh, when you're famous. Uh, we don't know exactly the specific Kylie, nature Kylie, we can of the, the claims see, that will be made Kylie, today. Kylie, Sorry, we can on. actually see live pictures coming from Los Angeles now. There we now see the woman coming into the room uh, at the press conference, and it's about to begin with that frustrating thought. We're going to have to come away from that story. It'll be online later to, from the Channel 4 News website. Now, that's all from here tonight in New York and Washington, but we'll leave you with a reminder of a different kind of America, one that arguably looked rather more outward and upward. The astronaut, Gene Cernan, has died aged 82. He was the last person to step foot on the moon. Following his lunar explorations, the American spaceman said he knew he knew no longer belonged solely to the Earth, but will forevermore belong to the universe. Here he is, in his own words, for a film he made about his life called The Last Man on the Face of the Moon. You don't sleep that well. You get up fairly early in the morning. You have your traditional breakfast. Then you go down and get suited up. You've been suited up a thousand times. This is for real. I was out there somewhere with the opportunity to see something and be somewhere and do something that only 12 human beings in the history of mankind have been able to do or be or see. I looked over my shoulder, and there's the Earth. There's reality. There's home. I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to press the freeze button. I wanted to stop time. Is that, is that dummy in there with my name on really me? I'm wondering what people are gonna think, not in another 40 years, but maybe another 100 years, who knows? Maybe another 1,000 years.